Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk about, I guess, uh, what ends up being an epic win. But um, it's not something in the future. It's not, it's not something that is far and far distant from here. It's actually from right here, from Monterey. And it's about a little bit of a different thing. It's, it's about the oceans. Uh, and it's about bringing the ocean back to life. And, and before we, we sort of talk about that, I, I want to just sort of bring us all together in trying to understand something really complicated and scientific, and that's the ecology of the ocean. But we can do that through a, through a very simple metaphor, something I think we all understand intuitively. Although it's a very complex thing, we understand this. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> and that... <laughs> That, well, I, actually, everyone understands that, right? You've experienced it. You know why it works. Uh, you try to avoid the consequences. Um, but I want to say that in, this, if, in terms of the environment and the planet, um, if the ocean ain't happy, ain't nobody happy as well. And the, and the reason is that the ocean is really part of our lives. It's part of what we, we do. It's part of how we live. Uh, and especially in Monterey here, uh, we're very close to it. And as a consequence, we can understand that a little more. Um, and it's because we actually do a great deal of damage to the ocean that we have to worry about what happens when the ocean is not happy. Uh, this is a picture from 1932. It's a picture of Cannery Row right next to the Hopkins Marine Station. And it shows the pollution and the intense slime that comes out of an enormous row of canneries running at peak capacity for about a decade. This was the biggest industrial fishing operation on the west coast of the United States. It processed a million pounds of fish every day for 15 years, and a lot of those fish uh, didn't go into cans. They went into the water, and they, f they soiled the air. Rolf Boleyn, who is a, a professor at the Hopkins Marine Station, where, where I work now, said in 1941, the fumes from the scum floating on the waters of the inlets of the bay were so bad they turned lead-based paints black. This was the worst time in the history of Monterey Bay. There had been a century of overexploitation. The otters were gone, the whales were gone, the seals were gone, the abalone were gone, the seabirds were gone, and now the sardines were being taken. This was the very worst part of the end, ecologically, of Monterey Bay. But it is not that way anymore. It's a fundamentally changed place. It's a beautiful place. It's a stunning place to live. When we go to work around here, you, just, you sometimes pinch yourself that it is so gorgeous and so wonderful. Well, it was not that way 70 or 80 years ago. It was an industrial hellhole. And so what I want to talk to you about is why it changed. What happened to bring it back to life? And I need to talk about it a little bit in terms of the ecology of the ocean, but it really is pretty simple too. I, sort of, I, I call it a simple adage. Pinch a whale, pinch a minnow, hurt a whale. Basically that all the species in the ocean are connected together in this pyramid of life. The smaller things grow fast. There's many of them. They're eaten by slightly bigger things. And the pyramid of life goes up to the very top. Uh, whales, large predators. That entire pyramid is what we we have in the ocean as its living ecosystem. And if we mess with that pyramid at any point, then it begins to fall apart and doesn't work so well. Well, that pyramid was seriously damaged by all of the exploitation and the over-industrialization of the canneries. But in this period of time when things looked really gloomy and really bad, there were a few people that fundamentally changed how Monterey Bay was to be in its, in its future. And they were people who achieved, in the, in the terms you just learned about, an epic win. But they didn't do it directly, and they didn't quite know how to do it, and they did it against enormous odds. And that's what I really want to talk to you about. I want to wrap the story around one person in particular. Uh, that's this person, Julia Platt. Now, Julia Platt had a PhD in zoology. She got it in 1893, but she didn't get it in the United States where she grew up because you couldn't get a PhD in zoology in the United States if you were a woman. You had to go to Europe to do it. That's what she did. She came to Pacific Grove to take up her career as a marine biologist, but she couldn't get a job 
as an academic marine biologist in, in <coughs> 1899 when she got here, uh, universities didn't hire women faculty members. Stanford didn't, my university, we do now. Um, <laughs> but Harvard didn't, Princeton didn't, Yale didn't, nobody did. Um, Julia then settled in Pacific Grove and she became a civic activist. And a civic activist that looked at a problem and said, I know that there's a solution to this problem and I'm going to directly find out what that solution is and do it. So here's a problem that Julia is solving. Uh, Susan McDougall, who owned the bathhouse near Lover's Point in Monterey, put a fence across the beach. That was illegal. Julia pointed it out that the public had the right to access to the beach. McDougall refused to take down that fence. In a relatively famous local incident, Julia climbed up on a ladder and filed the lock off. It got put back. She broke the lock off. It got put back. And this is Julia back on the ladder with an ax and a crowbar ripping down the fence in order to give people access to the beach again. And not only that, I mean, she's not shy. She was posed for this picture, right? Um, she also put up this placard. It says, opened by Julia B. Platt, this entrance to the beach must be left open at all hours when the public might reasonably wish to pass through. I act in the matter because the council and police department of Pacific Grove are men and possibly somewhat timid. <laughs> the fence stayed down. <laughs> And this was Julia's first win against pretty big odds, and she didn't want to stop there because she thought at the time the biggest threat to her town, Monterey and Pacific Grove, was the pollution coming out of the canneries. This is a shot from 1945 showing some of the pollution coming out at that particular point. This was a problem too big for Julia, though. She, she filed lawsuits. She won every single one. But it didn't matter because the economic power of the canneries was so high that they did what they wanted anyway. So this was a problem, something like what we sometimes face when we think about global climate change. It's too big for us. Nothing we can do individually will solve the problem. We fall into some sort of despair. Julia felt, faced the same thing. It wasn't global, but it was bigger than her. What did she do to help solve that problem? She took out an ad in the paper. The ad said, I am not an atheist. Now, how does this solve the problem? Well. What she decided to do was decided to run for mayor of Pacific Grove, get some political power, and then begin to work towards the problem. She couldn't run for mayor because she was a scientist and a single woman, so therefore she was probably an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Methodist church town, remember, Pacific Grove. So she took out an ad saying she's not an atheist. She ran a very simple campaign. The only slogan was, it will take a good man to beat me. And uh, nobody did. And she was elected mayor of Pacific Grove in uh, 1931. So with this political power behind her, you might think she would go after the canneries. But she didn't. What she did was something indirect, but that would pay off enormously in the end. Her immediate goal was to protect a part of the Monterey Bay shoreline in perpetuity. And she did this uh, for a very simple reason. She did it to leave a legacy of a protected shore, even right next door to the biggest canneries on the West Coast, from where the tiny larvae may swim or be carried by currents to all points along the shore, and become attached, grow up, and replace those taken for food or curio. She was a marine biologist, and she wrote actually into the minutes of the Pacific Grove City Council essentially a treatise on how you make marine protected areas in order to protect e marine ecosystem function in 1930 one, before anybody else did. She conceived of the Hopkins Marine Life Refuge, which is in front of the Hopkins Marine Station right now, and the Pacific Grove Marine Gardens, both of which still exist and have been expanded in uh, subsequent decades. This is the uh, picture of, of the boundaries, uh, the 1931 boundaries of the Hopkins Marine Life Refuge. Uh, they expanded um, in 1984 and uh, just last year because of the Marine Life Protection Act, this reserve now extends all the way to Lover's Point as well. <coughs> well, she formed this refuge in 1931, died in 1934, and the refuge made no difference. In fact, the refuge did not make a difference for 29 years. The canneries were still booming, the pollution was even worse than before, but the refuge was there functioning and waiting. 
this is just a, a picture of the, the sardine uh, catch in Monterey over the subsequent years. It's a little strange because the background is, is odd. But what you can see, the refuge was formed in 1931. The sardines collapsed in about 1947, 1948. And by 1952 or so, the, the canneries were gone. The economy was ruined. The pollution started to go away. Uh, this is a picture of the derelict, derelict Hovden cannery, uh, which is now the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, in about, this picture was taken about in the early 1960s, showing what was left in uh, the sardine fisheries. And the sardines, by the way, were, were gone because of overfishing, but also because the climate changed. And the climate change and the overfishing were a double whammy the sardines really couldn't deal with. Well, what happened uh, to bring back the ecosystem in Monterey Bay. A couple of fortuitous things. Um, one was that sea otters weren't extinct after all. Now the Spanish had taken 100,000 sea otters out of the, the coast of California, driven them all the way into a tiny little unknown refuge on the coast of Big Sur. They were discovered in the 30s and protected and they slowly expand their population. And in April 1963, they came back into Monterey Bay. Now otters are strange creatures. They're small, they live in cold water, they eat enormous amounts of fresh seafood every day. A 60 pound otter has to eat 20 pounds of fresh seafood a day or it loses weight. They don't eat for three days, they're dead because the water is so cold they have a high metabolic rate. They came back into Monterey Bay and their favorite food is abalone. And sea urchins if they can't get abalone. Where were the only sources of really amazing populations of abalone in Monterey Bay? In Julia's Refuge. Everywhere else the abalone were taken by, by fishermen and recreational folks. I mean many of you in the audience might, might have been doing abalone um, free diving in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, everybody did it. But in the Hopkins Marine Refuge, it wasn't done and the entire shore was plastered cheek by jowl by abalone the size of almost the size of dinner plates. The otters came into Monterey Bay, made a beeline for the Hopkins Marine Life Refuge where their favorite food was. They ate the abalone, they ate the urchins, and as a consequence of that, they restored the kelp forest. Now why do otters and kelp forests have a link? It's because abalone and sea urchins actually are one of the main herbivores on kelp. Now remember that pyramid I talked to you about where things eat other things. The kelp's at the bottom, abalone and, and sea urchins are in the middle and otters at the top. With otters there, the abalone and the sea urchins were eaten away. The kelp forest bloomed and John Pierce, who was one of the founding faculty of U, uh, Santa, UC Santa Cruz, drew this map with some of his students in 1972, only about nine years after the otters came back, the kelp forests in front of China Point, where the Hopkins Marine Station is, were back. John taught kelp forest ecology there for decades. Kelp forest ecology is still taught there. An entire ecosystem came back. Uh, that happened all over Monterey, not just around Hopkins, but the seed of that population of otters around Hopkins began to grow around the bay. Uh, kelp forest came back around the bay, and with it come a large number of other species. Now when you go into a forest, a terrestrial forest, there's lots of other species there. There's the understories, there's the plants and the animals that live in the forest. The same is true of a kelp forest. There's many species that live along our shores now because of the protection of the kelp, lots of fish, lots of invertebrates. Seals came back. The West Beach around Hopkins is one of the largest haulouts of harbor seals along the entire west coast of the United States. They're living there, protected by the refuge and in the middle of a thriving kelp forest. Seabirds came back, not just because they were protected by the refuge, but because of other laws, like for example, when we banned the use of DDT in the United States, that allowed their shells to harden back up again. Uh, birds like egrets, cormorants, brown pelicans began to thrive and came back into this environment. The recovery of Monterey Bay is actually a pretty complicated story uh, with a whole set of people besides Julia. Uh, Carolyn Sotka and I have recently finished a book It'll be out in just a few months um, called The Death and the Life of Monterey Bay. It's a story about the revival of this bay, the people that were an instrumental in making, making it happen, and the reason why the revival of the bay has been locked in by the kind of society now that we find in Monterey. But the important thing about this is that Julia's Reserve at the time was a pioneering effort. Nobody was doing that. 
and it didn't pay off in her lifetime. It didn't even pay off in the next decade. It took 29 years before the legacy that she put in paid off by the otters coming back. A lot of people have been instrumental in recovering Monterey Bay. Uh, not only Julia, but uh, the people that conceived and built the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the fishermen who have dedicated their lives to fishing in this particular area, and really some of the, the longest term marine conservationists that there can be. Um, it takes a lot of people to do this. But the point of my talk here is that 80 or 70 or 80 years ago, this was an, an environment that you might have looked at and given up on. People didn't give up on it. People worked on it to try to make it better. That pioneering effort, those epic wins that they generated, is what we have today. So when you look at the bay that we have today, when you look at the environment that we have, when you smile because you are lucky enough to live here, it's because of these things that have happened in the past. If they can happen in the past, they can happen in the future. Every place is a little bit different. But doing what you can do, making a small effort that you know is right because you can make a difference is what Julia did and that's what I'm going to suggest is the seed of hope for all of us. Find what you can do and do it. Thanks. <laughs>